Hey, uh, we really are stronger together. Yes. Amen. So if this is your first time, we are glad you are here. Amen. And if you've been here for a long time, I'm glad you've been here for a long time. Uh, so I'm going to uh, invite you to go ahead and get your outline. And uh, today we start a five-week series. All right. This is a five-week series. And the, uh, the, the name of this series is Stronger Together. Amen. And uh, this is what I'm going to teach uh, for the next five weeks. Today I'm telling I'm going to show you the why. Say with me the why. The why. I'm going to show you why we're stronger together and how you are blessed when you serve. Uh, next week we're going to talk about the ordinary. How many of you are ordinary? Thank you. The rest of y'all must be angels. Uh, you can go to heaven now, but the rest of y'all that are in there, what I'm trying to tell you is that God does not use, remember my friend from Guatemala said, God does not use perfect people. He uses broken people. And God in the Bible always used ordinary people like you and me. So again, let me ask you, how many of you are ordinary? That's what I thought. So that means God can use you. And then we're going to talk about the gift. That week, we're going to give you a gift. We're going to give you another outline. All right, and then uh, we're going to conclude week four and five by teaching you how to have the right attitude to serve. You know, how, how many of you know that it doesn't matter how smart and how talented you are, if you don't have the right attitude, you weren't go, you're not going to go far. Do you know that your, alt, your attitude determines your al altitude? Your attitude determines how high you go. So tell the person next to you, we're stronger together. So let me pray and we'll get started and you'll follow me in your outline. Father, this morning we are so grateful for another day. Thank you because it is through Christ that we love you and that we serve you and that we get to know you. And um, I thank you for, for all the volunteers that you have given new life. Thank you for those that serve day in, day out, Sunday after Sunday. And I just pray that today you would... Uh, tug at our heart and fully help us understand that we are stronger together and that all of us can play a part in, in, in what you are doing through new life and what you want to continue to do. In Jesus' name I pray and everyone said, Amen. Amen. So uh, I came to Galveston in 1991. My wife and I were, uh, had one child. Today we have three children. Hopefully one day we'll have grandchildren. Amen. I bought a t-shirt recently that says premature granddad. Um, so I told, I told my son that since he doesn't want to make me a grandfather yet, I already adopted Ki Yong's grandchild because we look alike. Uh, so I'm, I'm his, un his granduncle, all right, or grandfather. So, But my wife and I came here in 1991. And that was the church when we came. It was an old army barracks. It was 400 square feet, and that's where we came. Uh, the, the name of the church many years ago was Mount Calvary, and that's where it all started. In 1994, in 1994 uh, the men of the church invested three months of their life. The people back then... We raised $150,000, and that building that you're seeing in the back, we, we built it with $75,000 because the men of the church actually built that building. That's our children's church back there. We were there for about four, four maybe five years, and in 1999, we started the construction of this current building. This building cost us would have cost us $1.2 million dollars. And we paid 600000 because the people from the church not only gave, but they used their talents, their abilities. And we built it. We took us a year, but we built it. Amen. We thank God because there's a construction company building it now. <laughs> but we bought these, the, the, the vacant lots over here where we have extra parking. We bought those lots, demolished the, the houses that were there. And in the in year 2000, we dedicated this building. Um, in, 19, in 2009, 2009, after the hurricane, we changed our name from Mount Calvary to New, to new Life. And uh, for those of you that don't know, um, when um, Hurricane Ike came to or, or entered Galveston, the eye of the hurricane came through here. 
uh, back then, we lost overnight 55% of the congregation. Overnight, about 250 people left, the, uh, left our church. I mean, the, the island lost about 15, 20% of the population. We lost 55% of the church population. And, but we believe that God was birthing, was giving us new life. So we changed the name of our church because uh, not only do people find new life through Christ Jesus, in, in essence, God was birthing something new in our church. A year after the hurricane, on October the 18th, on October the 18th, we started this English service. Uh, those of you that have been here are excited. The rest are like, okay. But, but... <laughs> But uh, you, you don't realize that it took, it took a step of faith to start this service. Because how do you start an English service with, with you've just lost 55% of your congregation? I remember I was coming from Houston. I was driving through Lake City. And, and God began to impress on me to start an English service. Now, I, 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 I'm not one that argues with God. I, I don't question God when God tells me. But, but that day I said, God, oh, oh Lord... Do you realize that we lost 55% of the congregation? Uh, you should have told me to start an English service five years ago. And he says, I actually did, but you didn't listen to me. I said, when? My oldest son had told me, my oldest son, David, dude, we call him dude. When he was 16 years old, he says, Dad, you need to change the name of the church. I said, what do you mean, Monte Calvary, Monte Calvary? And then he said this. He says, and you need to start an English service. I said, why? He says, because none of my friends come to our church because they don't understand your Spanish. I said, well, they better learn Spanish if they're going to go to heaven. Because Jesus is in heaven. Yes, but Jesus. <laughs> but my, my son had actually told me five years before. To, well, long story short, we changed the name. We started the service. How many of you were here when we started that first service? Raise your hand. This is the person. You were actually in the first service. You were actually in the first service. Raise your hand. Keep your hands up. Three, five, six, seven, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty. 14, 16, 18, 20. Raise your hand. Y'all sure y'all not? Know. All right. We actually started that service between 40 or no more than 50 people. And this is the service that has grown the most in the past years. All right. So in, 19, in 2009, we started the English service. And thank God for that because God does speak English also. They say that if you want to learn the language of love, learn French. I don't know why they say that. If you want to learn the language of business... Learn English. But if you want to go to heaven, you better learn Spanish. <laughs> Is Jerry here? Is Jerry? Oh, there's Jerry. Jerry's from Nigeria, and I taught him Spanish. This is the only Spanish Jerry knows. Te invito que me invites a comer. <laughs> this is what it means. I taught Jerry, say this. I taught Jerry, when you, when you see our Spanish brothers, tell them that. I invite you to invite me to eat. So if Jerry approaches you, he's going to practice his Spanish with you. Te invito, que, oh, invítame a comer, he's going to tell you. But he's making it. Amen. Amen. All right. So last year, last year in 2006, uh, 2016, we broke ground on our new building. Uh, December of last year, we broke ground, and that building is going to be totally for the children and the youth of our church. Because we believe that God is going to raise up doctors, lawyers, businessmen, and women, pastors, pilots. Our kids are not going to be the next drug pushers. Our kids are going to be the next doctors, the next lawyers. Our kids are not going to go to prison. They're going to be the lawyers. They're going to get people out of prison. I believe that wholly. So hopefully, hopefully, before Thanksgiving... Your kids, because I don't have kids here no more, your kids are going to be in that new building. Our kids by, are going to be in that new building. Amen. So if you come to the Tuesday service, if you come to the Tuesday service, I told you this past week that we're gonna, I'm going to give tours on Tuesday of that new building. 
So if you want to see the building, come. We're going to pray for about 40, 45 minutes. And then my wife, Cynthia, and myself, we're going to be the tour guides. And remember that when you go on a tour, you always tip. <laughs> the tour is free. The tour is free. But seriously, on Tuesday, we're going to finish the service about 745. And we're going to take groups of 20. Now, if you, if you come... And if you have a child, the only, the only prerequisite, we're not going to allow any children in the building because there's construction going on, and we don't want none, any, any of our children to run around or to anything happen to them. So if you have a child, and if you want to go in the building, you're going to have to have someone take care of your child, and then you can go in the building, and then either your husband or you go in. But it's going to be only for adults and for the young people. Quickly, we're going to give you the tour. The stairs are up. The elevator arrives this Friday, and it's going to take them about three, four weeks. So the building is going to have elevator. I know a lot of us need to do exercise, but we're going to have an elevator in that new building. And the only reason we have to have elevator because that's the code for handicap. And uh, we're going to have the, it's going to be awesome. They painted the ceiling this week. And your children are going to enjoy that building. And it's going to be awesome. Amen. Now, why do I tell you all of this? For this. What if the best years for new life are behind us? If you were here last week, I told you that when I was between the age, I'm 51. When I was between 40 and 44, 40 and 45, I don't think I was going through a midlife crisis. I really don't. Uh, but, but the enemy, you know that little devil, the little devil I told you last week that speaks to you? For four years, I struggled with the thought that my best years were behind me. I, I was 40, 45 years old. So last week, I, I encourage you to believe that the best is still yet to come. But today, you say, okay, Pastor, last week you, you had us believe that God has the last say and that our best years, and now you're going back and asking us, what if the best years for the church are behind us? What if my, year, my best years are behind me? I'm 51. What if my best year, I've been the pastor here going on 27 years. What if my best years are behind me? What if your best years are behind you? I don't know how old you are. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. I'll stop there. But I refuse to believe, honestly, I refuse to believe that as, our chur as a church, our best years are behind us. Now, why do I refuse to believe that? I want you to read what I wrote there. Re read it with me. New life is a place where the lost are found, the tired are renewed, the lonely find community and the brokenhearted are healed. The place where the family of God worships together. God uses the church to change life. And those changed life inspire others to believe that God can also change them. The heart of our church, the heart of new life, and the life groups is its people, especially the volunteers. If we want to see new life advance... We must raise up more volunteers. We want everyone to fully understand that saved people serve others. Come on, say it again. Saved people serve others. And more people doing less is our prayer and our desire here at New Life. Now, this is the fact. On any given Sunday, on any given Sunday, we average... Between 450 to 500 people. Last, last Sunday, we were close to 540. In our live groups, our live groups have more people than on our Sunday services. We have about 48, 49 live groups. And we have close to 520, 550 people in live groups. Some of you come on Sunday. Thank you for coming on Sunday. But the truth is... Once you become part of a life group, you grow together because we are stronger together. Amen. Now, we have an average of an average between the life groups and those that come on Sunday. We could average it up to about 500 people that come to, to our church. Out of those 500, we average anywhere between 150, 175 volunteers. Amen. My prayer is that by this, the end of this year, we double that number through over 300 volunteers in our church. Why? 
This is, this is a why. The why is because we're stronger together. The why is save people, serve people. Jesus didn't say, if, if I was to ask you, I mean, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being funny here. And, 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 and Jesus didn't save you just to deliver you from hell. Someone said, God didn't save you only to give you insurance from, from, uh, for you to get, have fire insurance. Make sure you're not going to hell. God didn't save you just for you to come on Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Save people. Serve people. And more people doing less is what makes us stronger together. So today, I want to quickly give you the why. Why I want to encourage you to volunteer if you're not a volunteer. Why we are stronger together when we serve. And why, in the end, the ultimate result, you're the person that's going to be blessed. When you serve others... You ultimately are the person that reaps the benefit of serving others. So quickly, let me give you five reasons or five blessings that you will experience by serving others. Number one, you will experience that serving allows you, allows us to discover and develop our spiritual gifts. Serving allows us to discover and develop our spiritual gifts. So... Here at New Life, I will encourage you, we will encourage you to discover and to develop your spiritual gifts. So let me read quickly 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 and 14. And Paul gives here the analogy of, the, of a body. And the Bible says this. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of, read it, even so, come on, come on, read with me, even so, oh, come on, guys, I'm, I'm seeing it now, and they're not seeing it, even so, that's why you're not reading, even so, <laughs> come on, even so, okay, even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of? All right, now, imagine this. Say with me, I have one, one head. Next to, look next to you and make sure the person next to you only has one head. <laughs> if they have two, <laughs> I would suggest you move. All right, now imagine for me, imagine with me that your whole body was a head. Thank you. Oh, Lord. <laughs> what that meant, you got a big head. You're a big head. All right. Imagine your whole body being a nose. You would be walking around. <laughs> Imagine your whole body being a nose. Imagine your whole body being an ear. Some of you already have bionic ears. <laughs> Imagine your whole body being a stomach. And we have a problem filling this one. Can you imagine if my whole body was a stomach? But God... That's a perfect God and knows how to make things. Made your body so awesome that we only have one head. Thank God for only one head. All right? We only have two eyes. Can you imagine if you had three? You would be a normal. So this body, two hands, two feet. You know, we have one heart, two lungs. Last time I checked, we have two kidneys. We do have two kidneys, right? I just want to make sure. <laughs> two kidneys. So can you imagine everything that God created your body to be, it functions. And the reason your body is strong, because even though it's one, it's one body, it has many parts. Well, Paul is talking about the church, and he's talking that we have many members, many members, many members. And he's not talking about church membership. He's talking about when you receive Christ, you become part of the family of God. You become part of the church of God. And even though we have many members, we are one body. And when we are one body, we are stronger yeah. together. Okay, so 
you might be here and says, okay, what is a spiritual gift? Let me explain to you what are natural talents, what are natural abilities, and then what are spiritual gifts. When you were born, when you were born, whatever date you were born, wherever you were born, God, when you were birthed, when you were born, God gave you natural abilities and natural talents. All of you, there's none, every one of you has natural abilities and natural talents. Some of you, my God, are awesome in painting. The rest of us, we messed up everything we paint because we don't have that ability. Some of you were, were given the ability to play, to sing. The rest of us is better for us to keep singing in, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our showers and where we're by ourselves. <laughs> Way by ourselves. Because you don't sing. I don't sing. But some of you, you God gave you, it's, it's a natural talent that you were born with. Some of you are very good at organizing. Others are, are very disorganized. Okay? Now... You have natural ability. Some of you are very good with your hands. Some of you are very good with what you, how you think. You're an organizer. You have creative ideas. We put you in a room and my God, you start flowing. Some of you, hey, put me with a, g- g- give me something in my hand. You're good. You're, you ha- you ha- God gave you natural talents. Amen. You have natural abilities. The problem is some of us don't use those. Some of us are thinking, man, if I had that ability, and if I could play, and if I could do that. Listen, you will never become who you need to become by envying and being jealous of others. God already gave you so much. You have so much to give, not only to this world, but to you. You have so much to contribute just along with your natural abilities. So your natural abilities came with you when you were born physically. The spiritual gifts are given to you when you are born again. Your natural abilities, your natural talents are given to you by God when you were born physically. Your spiritual gifts are given to you when you are born again. So here you are. You have natural abilities, natural talents. And if you are saved, you've been born again, God gave you at least, at least one spiritual gift. So in other words, you're loaded with God-given talents and spiritual gifts for you to serve. And when you serve and when, our, and, I, and when I serve and when we put our abilities and when we use our spiritual gifts, we are stronger together. together. The problem is, this is what most of us do. I read a story years ago of a puzzle, of a puzzle. And you know... Every little piece has its place to make what you're putting together. And one day, one part of the puzzle says, you know what? I don't like where I go. I don't like where I go. I'd rather be on the top. I'd rather be on this corner of the puzzle. So he himself moved. And when he moved, you know what happened? The puzzle, the picture, the view... Whatever it was, could never be seen again because it moved everything. And after many years, he says, you know what? I think I'm going to go back to where I was originally was. So he moved back, and when he moved back, the puzzle was seen again. And see, that's what we do, most of us. We go out through life wanting to be what God didn't create us to be. We want to be where we were not supposed to be. And suddenly when you discover God's gifts and you develop God's gift and use them for the glory of God and you use them to serve others, it's when we are stronger together. So if you're going to serve, the first blessing is that it's going to help you. It's going to allow you to discover and to develop your spiritual gift. The second blessing or the second why is serving allows us to experience miracles. Serving allows us to experience miracles. The Bible says in John chapter 2, verse 5 and 8, read with me. His mother said to the servants, come on, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for the ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. 
Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. Now, those of you that are familiar with the Bible, you know that this passage is the passage where Jesus performs his first miracle. Jesus performed his first miracle at a wedding, the wedding of Cana. And the Bible says that they had run out of wine. And the, and the Bible says that Mary goes to Jesus, Je, Mary, the mother of Jesus, goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, we want you, we, we need for you to do a miracle. Now, this is what Jesus does. Jesus does not go to the wedding and says, okay, what's left over of the wine? Let me multiply it. He doesn't do a miracle that way. The Bible says that Mary told the servants, do everything that he tells you. In other words, do everything that Jesus tells you. And the Bible says that Jesus simply told certain servants, we don't know if there were six, we don't know if there were 12, we do know that there were six jars containing anywhere from 20 to 25 up to 30 gallons. And the Bible says that these servants got these containers, got these jars, and the Bible says they put water, they poured water up to the brim. And the Bible says that they carried the jars, and when they arrived at the wedding, then Jesus says, okay, start pouring out of from there. And when they started pouring, the Bible says, we don't know when the miracle was performed. We don't know if it was performed when they acted on Jesus' command and they got the jar, they put the water. We don't know if, if, if when they were going. But we do know that as they were pouring out, it was no longer water. It was wine. See, in the Bible, there's only one time that God performed miracles by himself. The only time God performed miracles alone by himself was when he created the universe. God said, let, let there be light, and there was light. But every miracle that you see in the Bible, God always used the collaboration, the help of a human being. The miracle of the parting of the Red Sea, God used Moses. When fire came from heaven, God used Elijah. In this occasion, not only did Jesus perform the miracle, but ye, Jesus used servants for them to experience. They were part of the miracle. And when you serve, you will no longer pour. We're not going to call you to bring jars and to bring water. Today, our mission is to fill the lives of people, what God has graciously given to us, that we pour ourselves on others, and we see not water turn into wine. We see drunkards turn into born-again believers. We see lives transformed by the power of God. One day, I walked into a church. I was 16 years old. I was a drug addict. I was going to hell. My mom did not know what to do with me. I was a, one of the biggest rust pushers in my high school, and my father was a heroin addict, and if God wouldn't have changed me, I would have been in prison today. I would have been shooting up heroin, but one day, God... God Someone saw an empty jar. I was an empty jar. And they started to pour out Jesus in me. And Jesus began to transform my life. And when you serve, when you serve, you get the blessing to experience the transformation of other people's lives. You get to experience miracles firsthand. So that's why we are stronger together. Number reason, point number three, the third blessing that you receive when you serve is that serving helps us to be more like Jesus. Amen. Serving helps us to be more like Jesus. Why are we Christians? Because we want to be more like Jesus. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like Mike. I'm, I don't want to be like Mike. Mike divorced his wife. I don't want to divorce my wife. You know who Mike is, right? The commercials, everybody wants to be like Michael Jordan. I want to be like Mike. What Mike is he talking about? <laughs> I'm not talking about this Mike. All right? I want to be more like Jesus. Now, Jesus was God when he came to earth. Not only was he God, but he was the son of God. And this is what he uttered. This is what he said in Matthew 20, 28. Jesus said, just as the son of man... 
did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. So Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If you're not serving, I would question if you're a Christian. Because saved people serve people. Jesus did not come to be served. He came to serve. And not only do I experience miracles, but when I serve, I become more like Jesus. Now, this is the truth. You will never be like you will never be Jesus. There is only one Jesus. I don't care if your name is Jesus. I don't know why we Hispanics call our kids Jesus. This is this is funny. This is funny. In our daycare, there's a little kid that is coming. His name is Christ. Cristo. He's not Jesus. His name is Cristo. When I heard, I hope you're not, your mom is not here. <laughs> Cut it up. Really? Are you here? Okay, praise the Lord. I don't know why they put in Cristo. His name is Christ. And I looked at him, you know, he don't look like Christ to me. You don't look like Joseph and Mary either. <laughs> but the truth is this, guys. When we serve, we're more like Christ. We're more like Christ. And there's nothing greater as a Christian to be more like Christ when we serve. Jesus said, this is what Jesus, the last teaching that Jesus gave his disciples, he says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you must serve one another. And you know what Jesus did? The Bible said he took a towel. Don't worry, we're not going to ask you to do that either. He took a towel, and the Bible says he began to wash the feet of his disciples to show us that he didn't only preach it, he lived it. And it's not enough for me to say, I'm a Christian, but I don't serve nowhere. If we're going to be more like Christ, serve people, serve others. Number four, the fourth blessing is that serving surrounds us with Christians who can help us follow Jesus. When you serve, you surround yourself with other Christians who, are, who can help you. And sooner or later, you can help them become or follow Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews, and let us consider, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you say that as you see the day approaching. All right? Now I was 16 years old. I was 16 years old when, when, I, when I first accepted Christ. My, my parents were not Christians. And, and um, there were men in my, in, our, in my local church, in my hometown, that, that God surrounded me with, that helped me to serve God. They, 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 they began to surround me, and they began to encourage me. And this is how they would encourage me. I was 16. Um, I had been doing drugs for four years since the age of 12 to 16, and all my friends, all my friends either did drugs or sold drugs. So if God didn't surround me with strong Christian men, I would have gone back to my own friends. See, when God saves you, first he takes you out of the world, second he takes the world out of you, and then he sends you back to the world. Because if, if God takes you out of the world, but he doesn't take the world out of you, sooner or later, you're going to go back to your own habits. And the only reason I, didn't, I never went back to the drugs, I never went back to my old child. To my, as a matter of fact, you heard me say this. One of my best friends married my sisters. If you were here with the first time he came, I wanted to say my, home, my homeboy. I said, there's my homeboy. And I said, yeah, my boyfriend, he's here. And my sister, no, no, he's not your boyfriend. <laughs> I wanted to say homeboy. <laughs> All right? So I never had boyfriends. Don't worry. I've never had boyfriends. <laughs> say, you're safe, you're safe. <laughs> All right? So, but, but God surrounded me with strong men that helped me in my walk with the Lord. And in turn, and in turn, 
God used me to do what others did for me. This is what I do today at church. I like to invest my life in men and young men that come to church that either had the same background that I had or simply grew up without a father. And I want to help them to become the man that God wants them to become. Because there were men that surrounded me all the way from Africa. My friend Edogo was here a couple of months ago. I mean, I could tell you the man that got, God surrounded me with a, with a patrolman engineer. God uh, uh, surrounded me with different men that poured their lives into me and helped me become the man that God wanted me to become. Yes, now, if, 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 if you get saved and you start coming to church and you don't surround yourself with strong Christians, sooner or later you're going to go back to your old, your old friends. Yeah. And you will never be an eagle as long as you hang around turkeys. Yeah. Yeah. Now, my friends weren't turkeys. <laughs> your friends aren't turkeys. But sooner or later they're gonna, their influence is going to pull your, the, pull pr- the, the peer pressure is going to pull you to go back to your old habits. So you need to surround yourself with strong women. Those of you that are women, oh, oh the Lord says for me, I need to surround myself. No, no, this is for the women. <laughs> I'm single. I need a woman in my life. Oh, that's for me. No, no, that's not for you. <laughs> Ladies, you need to surround yourself with strong women, and you're going to find that women in your life group. You need to surround yourself with, with, with men, men that are going to help you. What Iron sharpens iron. Woo! And we become better, all right? So how do you do that? You keep coming to church, but don't only attend church. Connect to a life group and start serving either in the life group or start serving in one of the areas of the church, and you'll get connected. In, in, in a minute, I'm going to conclude, and I'm going to use uh, different te- three testimonies, and they're going to share. In the morning, in the morning, the testimony that I heard, that we shared. Is Miguel up there? Ya se fue Miguel. Ahí está Miguel. ¿Dónde está Miguel? Miguel somewhere there. Miguel, he, he's a uh, life group supervisor. He supervises either eight or nine life groups, him and his wife. And he helps out in the sound system. And this is what he says. Honestly, I don't like to get up early on Sunday mornings, but he has to be here by 8 o'clock for the first service. And this is what he says. By serving... You start growing roots in the church. By serving, not only do you start planting and growing roots, but you start helping other people and you start surrounding yourselves with other Christians. And they help you. And in the long run, you start helping other people. Um, uh, David and Monica, they help me with, with teaching the discipleship class. And sometimes I give one or two classes. So... Yesterday, I gave a a discipleship class, and um, one of the things that we'll teach you, we'll teach you to pray, and and if if, if it so happened that that you're with me when I do it, I literally don't force you, but I have you pray, and yesterday, uh, some of the guys that came, I said, well, this is the Lord's Prayer, and this is how we pray, and we're going to do it in one minute or less. And they looked at me and he goes, really? I'm going to pray? I said, yeah. Because a Christian, that's part of our Christian, one of our Christian habits, one of our Christian exercises. So we prayed. And then before we concluded, the, I taught them how to read the Bible and how to do their soaps. What is soap? What is soap? I found out years ago that the best way to read the Bible is to get one scripture, put it down, write the scripture. You use it. They always, for operate observation, you, you observe the context. You write it down. You write how are you going to apply that verse, and then you write a prayer. One of the young men, he's 17 years old, and, he, and his topic was better days are ahead of me, 17 years old. And I said, write the date down. Because you're going to have to remind yourself that one day in 2017, the last day of, of September, God spoke to you by reading and doing your soap and taught you that there's be- better days ahead of you. 17-year-old kid. 17-year-old kid. As we were concluding, I asked him, 
what's the best thing that you liked about the discipleship class or what thing that we learned? Three of them told me, Pastor, we had never prayed in public. Today we prayed. I remember the first time I prayed in public, I was clapping by myself. <laughs> I was so nervous. I wasn't clapping over here. I was... But they prayed. I said, Pastor, we had never prayed in public. We didn't know we could pray. You can do it because prayer is talking to God as you talk to a friend. Yeah, yeah. And then I asked the mom, what did you like the most? I said, Pastor, I didn't know how to read the Bible. I didn't understand the Bible. But I do, now, I do know now that by getting one scripture and getting the soap, I'm going to be able to read the Bible. See, and that's what happens in the life groups. That's when it happens when you surround yourself with other Christians. They either help you or sooner or later you start helping someone else yeah. to grow in your faith. And we are stronger. Yeah. Finally, finally, the last blessing that you will experience is that serving is good for your soul. Serving is good for your soul. All right? So in your outline, let me tell you this, and I'm going to conclude. We need you. We're here for you, and you need this. You may not realize it, but you do. Okay? Let me conclude by giving you this personal testimony. My wife and I moved here in 1991. I was 24 years old, had been married almost going on four, five years. We got married in 19... 2000, excuse me, we got married, and all my kids are miracles if I married in 2000, right? We got married in 1987, we got married in 1987, and my oldest son was born in 1988. So three years later, when he was three years old, when he was three years old, 1991, we moved to Galveston. So that meant dude, dude, dude was three years old, my wife and I were going to be married when we got here. We got here in March. Our anniversary is in April. We were, we we're going to celebrate our fourth anniversary as, as a married couple. Not only was this church my first church. I was a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor. But now I was going to be uh, the pastor. I was 24 years old. I was a dad of a three-year-old kid. Been married to my BMW, my beautiful Mexican wife. But my upbringing, my upbringing was coming out in my first five years of my marriage. I was very insecure. I was born with a poor mentality. I, I was born with a mentality that I thought that everyone was better than me, that I didn't have what it took. And even though I was a pastor, I had a, I had a, lot, of in, a lot of insecurities. Not only did I have a lot of personal problems... Me and my wife, our first five years of marriage, so I want to speak to you that are married, that you're a year or two or three or four or five or whatever you're at. Believe me, if God can restore our marriage, God can restore your marriage. Because I was a pastor, and me and my wife, thank, you know, you've heard my testimony. My, my biological father has been married five times, and the woman that he now has is not his wife, so I call him the Samaritan because that's what the Samaritan was in the Bible. My biological father has been divorced six times. So it's a miracle. My wife and I will celebrate our 31st anniversary next year. And it's only a miracle that we're still married. All right? It's a miracle that my wife has put up with me. She's not here today. If not, she would say, amen. <laughs> Pray for me, she would say. But we had a lot of marital problems. We had a lot of financial problems. The church back then, you saw the small building. On any given Sunday, we were maybe 20 at the most 25. There were Sundays that we didn't have musicians. And I don't know how to sing. One day, I, I opted to sing. And one of the ladies said, Pastor, we called you to preach, not to sing. <laughs> she, said in a gracious, she said it in a gracious way, right? So, so. It was very difficult, guys. Truly, it was very difficult. Our first three years here in Galveston, it was very difficult for my marriage, for me. I, I didn't know how to be a pastor. This was the first church I had. I was actually the senior pastor. I didn't know how to pastor. I was not a good pastor. I was not a good husband, and I was not a good dad. So I said, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? So you know the story. I wanted to leave Galveston. I wanted to leave Galveston. 
I wanted to leave the church. I said, man, if the church hasn't grown, honestly, our first three years here, the church didn't grow. We were the same numbers. We were the same people. So I said, I'm losing my time because everything in God begins small but grows. So I knew in my heart that God wanted the church to grow, but I didn't know how to do it. See, before God before grows anything, he has to grow you first. Before God begins to heal anything, he'll start to heal you first. And this is the truth, guys. I was very selfish. Those first years of my marriage, I only thought about me. I, I remember on our honeymoon, on our honeymoon, my wife and I... We'd been married three, four days, and we're on our honeymoon, and we walked into this department store. And I quickly go to where the ties and the shirts for men, the men's department, I run over there. And after about five or ten minutes, I suddenly look around, and my wife is crying in the department store. And I thought, oh, my God, after a week, she already misses her mama? (laughs) Because we've been married a couple of days. So I go over, and I said, hey, girl, what's I told her, ¿Qué pasa? ¿Qué, qué tienes? What, what's wrong? And she, she was crying. So I'm thinking, what did I do? And uh, my wife said, this is what she says. She says, you know, when we left the hotel, you told me we were coming to the department store. Never once did you ask me what would I like. And once we walked into the department store, you forgot that you're married, and you walk quickly to the men's department, and you have... Now, my wife was not being selfish. She was tr- only trying to tell me that I have not thought about her. And see, and that's the biggest problem that all of us... The biggest problems in your marriage is because one of you will be selfish. You marry to make the other person happy, and now you want to be happy. Don't you realize that when you make your spouse happy, you're going to be happy? I didn't hear no amens, but that's the truth. Well, God allowed, God allowed many things. I don't have time to tell you. God allowed many things to transpire those three years. And one of the things that transpired, that there was two families in the church that needed my help and my attention as a pastor. One of the families... They were facing that their mom was battling cancer. And then the other family, their son was in jail. So when I wanted to leave, God allowed or used, God used these two families, these two situations. And what I did for the next three months of my life, August, September, October, and almost November, I dedicated and trying to help these families and what they were going through. When I forgot, when I forgot what I was going through, and I began to focus in helping others what they were going through, my fifth point is, when you serve, it is your soul that's going to be enriched. It is your soul that is going to be transformed. And by me helping others going through what they were going through, without me knowing... God began to help me through what I was going through. And this is the life lesson that I learned. And I leave you with this. This is the life lesson that I learned. There will never be a moment in your life. There will never be a moment in your life. There will never be a day. There will never be a month. There will never be a year that you're not going to face a problem. That you're not going to face a challenge. That you're going to face a weakness in your life. But the biggest lesson that God gave me in the beginning of those years in 1993 going to 94 was this. Either I could focus the rest of my life, the rest of my life, I could focus on my problems, on my insecurities, on my marital problems, on my financial problems, everything that I didn't have, everything I wasn't yet, I could focus on that. Or I can focus on God's purpose for my life, on God's purpose for the church. And years ago, I decided that I was going to focus my attention on God's purpose for my life. And what happened, when I began to serve God's purpose, God began to take care of my problems. Because the problems are not going to go away. I don't have the power to resolve resolve problems. But my God is bigger than my problems. And when I focus on God's purpose 
God's purpose in my life became bigger. God's vision for my life became bigger. Problems have not gone away, but I am not focused on my problems. I am serving the God that saved me. I am serving the purpose of my God. My problems are going to continue to be there, but God has a way sooner or later because he still has the last word to bring peace in the midst of the problems, to restore my kids, to give me the finances, to heal my marriage. See, ultimately, the one that was benefited was me. And I learned that when I serve God's purposes, my problems are still there. But God has a way to say, hey, don't worry. I got your back. Seek first key the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything will be added to you. So my question is, what are you focused on? Are you focused on God's purposes, God's dreams for your life? Or are you going to continue to live and focus your attention on all your problems? There will never be a perfect time for you to serve. There will never be a perfect time. Some of you, you know, right now I have a kid. I, I'm just a newborn mom. Right now I have a teenager. Right now they're gone. You will never be a perfect moment for you to serve as long as you're focused on your problems. But if you focus on your God and serve his purposes, your soul will be enriched. You will discover, you will develop your gift. God will use you to experience miracles. And you will discover that we are stronger Come on, give God a big hand clap. So let me conclude. I'm going to ask Willie. Come on, Willie, Vicky, and Frank. Come on, give these guys a round of applause. These are guys and ladies that on any given Sunday, they serve in different capacities. So we're going to start with the new kid on the block. Testing. All right. Willie, that's your mic. Willie, how old are you? 14. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask y'all. <laughs> You're 14. All right, how long have you been coming to church, Willie? Uh, probably three years now. Three years, since you were 11. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right, Willie, please tell us in what areas you serve and how long you've been serving. I serve in the media, and I've been serving for one and a half years. How long? One and a half. One and a half, okay. How has it helped you to serve in the areas that you serve? I started to meet new people, and it got me closer, and now that I go to all three services, I can pay attention you better. You what? Go to all three services. You pay attention better? Why, you weren't paying attention? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you serve in all three services? Yes. Really? Praise the Lord. Can you imagine when he's 17, 18, 20, 21, 22, how God is going to use him, and God is going to bless him? So, Willie... Thank you for serving. All right. Ms. Vicky, don't, wor don't worry. I'm not going to ask you your age. Thank you. We do want to know how old is Daryl. Please I tell don't us remember. how long you've been coming to our church. How long have you been attending our church? Um, about f almost five years. Okay. Where do you serve in, in, at our church? I um, serve as an usher, um, an offering counter, and I'm also an assistant life group leader. Okay. How long have you been serving in those three areas? Three More years. or less. Three, three years? years. Okay, how has it helped you personally by you serving? It has opened my heart to accept God. Um, I have, I've become a part of a big family. I have support, great support people here. Um, like you said, the women have strong women support in their life group, and that we definitely do. And it helps me when I'm in need. Those are the people that I turn to. Who has helped you personally in your, in your area where you serve? Um, Tessie Contreras, who was my life group leader, she's a major influence. Um, Belinda Reyes, she's also a mentor. And Linda and uh, Chachi have been my, my big influences. All right. Give Vicky a big round of applause. <laughs> Short and sassy. Sass. <laughs> Frank, who are you married to? Minerva. Who? My BMW. BMW. <laughs> All right. Frank, how long have you been attending our church? We've been attending here since 2003, so I would say approximately about 14 years. 14 years. You were like his age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Frank, what, in what areas do you serve? Well, we started off in the youth ministry with J23, which was the best youth group. 
Uh, we started off with J23. Then after J23. How, how long did you serve in, with J23? We started with J23 for about two years. All and right. then after J23. What did you do with J23? What did you and Minerva do with the young people? We were sponsors and now parents to the, to the youth at that time. We were parents to them. They were a lot of single parent kids and we helped develop them and helped them grow up to be who they are today. Y'all didn't teach. Y'all didn't preach. Y'all just came and yeah, supervised, supervised and helped. Supervised and helped. Yeah, no, we didn't preach to them, though. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What, in what areas do you serve now? I serve now as a parking lot usher. I've been doing that for the last 10 years. And uh, also... You, you serve in what? The parking lot usher. What do you do in the parking lot? I help direct the traffic, help people park. Do you tell Welcome. the pastor where to park, too? Yes, yeah, every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> two weeks ago, two weeks ago, go... <laughs> so I get off and I said, you know, we have a cop, right? And I said, who's a cop? You or him? I said, right now it's me. He said that. He goes, okay, I'm going to go talk to the cop inside. His wife goes, no, no, no. And that's all right, Pastor. That's all right. <laughs> all right. How has it helped you when you started her with the young people and now as you're parking cars? How has it helped you? It's helped develop me a whole lot um, from somebody in the worldly world coming into the churches helped me develop to be who I am today, a decent, great person. Um, and it's good for your soul. Okay. If there is young couples here that, that are here and says, you know, how can we help with the young people? You started helping without you knowing the Bible, without you, you, just, you, you and uh, Minerva just volunteered to help. Why? 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 Because, wow, because we loved, at that time when we got here, we loved kids. Our kids, our daughter was a teenager, our sons were teenagers, and seeing the teenagers here just made us want to be a part of their lives and help them develop and grow. Okay, and why do you keep helping us parking cars? I love, I love what I do. I love being a part of the church. I love serving church. I love serving this church. I love serving God. I love serving the people and welcome them and thanking them for coming. Okay. Come on, give Willie, Miss Vicky, and Mr. Frank. Come on, give them a round of applause. Thank you guys. And thank you for serving. Thank you for serving. You'll never know what you do makes a difference in our church. So look, I want you to give a big round of applause to all our volunteers here at New Life. Come on. We are really stronger together.